Lifting Up Jesus, Opening His Word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Yesterday afternoon, passers-by noticed two people, apparently unconscious, on a bench in Salisbury. The area was investigated by people in protective suits as suspicions built that the two victims had been poisoned. They were in Salisbury Hospital tonight, described as critically ill. We are unable to ascertain whether or not a crime has taken place. A major incident, however, has been declared today and a multi-agency response has been coordinated. The BBC established that the man being treated is Sergei Skripal. He was convicted by a court in Moscow in 2006 of being a spy for British intelligence. He was sent from the court to the Gulag, where he languished for four years. It was in 2010 that the arrest of a network of Russian agents in the United States provided an opportunity for MI6 to repay its debt to Skripal. The UK asked for his name to be added to a list of prisoners the CIA was putting together. And in July of that year, Skripal and three others were put on a jet from Moscow to Vienna. The ten accused by the US of espionage, among them Anna Chapman, were flown from America and in the best Cold War traditions, the two parties of spies crossed on the tarmac in Austria. Asked about who might have betrayed this American spy ring, President Putin vented his fury publicly. Traitors will kick the bucket, trust me. These people betrayed their friends, their brothers in arms. Whatever they got in exchange for it, those 30 pieces of silver they were given, they will choke on them. As for Skripal, he flew from Vienna to Britain where he began a life in exile. Police were today securing the house in Salisbury where the former Russian intelligence officer has lived in recent years. Well, that was Mark Urban and Mark's here. Now, Mark, you started to there, but give us a little bit more of a sense of who this man is. Well, people who've met him talk about a tough ex-paratrooper, ex-special forces, uh, very proud of that, who gravitated towards Russian military intelligence, the GRU. Now, if you believe the court case that was uh, heard against him back in 2006, at some point in the late 90s, he started working for MI6, at a time when it was very hard mm. to penetrate the GRU. I can remember talking to Western spies at the time, and they said, post-Soviet collapse, this was the last element of the, of the Russian intelligence community as it had become that was really tight and held together. So the recruitment would have been quite an achievement for mm. MI6 at the time. And I understand that as a full colonel, he moved on to the so-called collegium, the people who run the panel that ran the GRU, and he was responsible for personnel matters. So he would have been in a position to open up the complete order of battle of the GRU in Western embassies throughout the early 2000s, throughout the early noughties before he was caught. So while he may not be at the very top Penkovsky or Gordievsky level of British penetration, he was a pretty senior agent and pretty important to Western intelligence during those years. We don't know what made him defect. What, what was he doing here latterly? Well, of course, you can imagine somebody who is uh, helpful to that degree to HMG will be looked after. And of course, we know that they put his name forward when these Russian agents were picked up in America in 2010. And the Russians, despite the fact that they'd convicted him for treason, mm -hmm. uh, agreed to set, send him back on the plane in order to get their agents back. Now, he would have got an MI6 pension, and I understand from people in the forces that he occasionally came and gave lectures about the GRU at military academies, and he also apparently sometimes acted as a bit of a consultant, if you like, uh, going to talk to other intelligence services as part of his sort of 
uh, uh, consultancy almost mm. uh, with MI6 that he did in return for this package. Not unlike, in fact, the type of work that Litvinenko did in terms of his conversations with the Spanish, which he had uh, as a consultant or whatever you want to call it. And yet he's now lying critically ill in a hospital in Salisbury, found in a very public place. What is your sense then of, of what has gone on? What are the theories? Well, as far as one can establish, he was a man without an enormous number of connections to other people, like in, in Salisbury or, or, or beyond. Mm. And he, he, he had a small nuclear family. Now, we know that his wife, Ludmilla, died in 2012 and is buried in the UK. His son died last year, uh, very early, but after an illness, people I speak to say they do not regard it as suspicious. But nevertheless, he was clearly in a vulnerable state, only one member of that family still surviving, his daughter. And it, it seems to be the case that someone was seeing him last week, came to, if you like, help him out, uh, perhaps at a difficult time uh, after uh, several months after the loss of his son. Now, we know that the son, uh, although he died in Russia on a holiday there, was repatriated to this country and is buried in this country. So there are all kinds of possibilities that somehow the repatriation of the son or the visit of someone else coming from Russia to see him may have been a way mm. that could have been used to fix his location and try and find out where he was. I mean, all of these are purely hypotheses at the moment because, as you said at the very beginning of the programme, no foul play has been proven. But if you were looking for how he might have been found, those are some of the things you might be looking at. Mark, thank you. Stay with us. We asked the Russian government to come on Newsnight tonight. They wouldn't, unfortunately, but joining us now live from Brussels is the former MI5 agent, Annie Machen, and here in the studio joined by Bill Browder, who calls himself Putin's enemy number one, whose lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, was, he believed, murdered by the Russian government. Very nice of you both to join us. Bill, I'll start with you, um, because you're right in front of me. What is your sense of what has gone on here? Well, we don't know the, the details yet, but when, when a major enemy of Russia um, suddenly um, becomes uh, critically ill from an unknown substance, um, one has to assume the worst, and, and one should start with the worst assumption and work their way back from that. And so uh, I, I would assume, until proven otherwise, the assumption should be that this man was poisoned, that he was poisoned with some type of substance from what what is known as the KGB poison factory. They have a, 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 a scientific research unit in Moscow, part of the FSB, which is the successor organization of KGB, in which they come up with, with um, poisons to assassinate their enemies. They've used these poisons here before with Litvinenko. There was another um, shocking death connected to my case, which was a man named Alexander Parapolichny, who dropped dead in Surrey in 2012 after blowing the whistle on, on a major Russian government corruption scheme. People die on a regular basis outside the country, and so we should assume, for the moment, until we know otherwise, that he's been assassinated. You would be or, surprised. Or, 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 you would be surprised if the Russian state, in some shape or form, were not behind whatever has happened this weekend in Washington. Well, we have we have no information. So, all, but 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 the assumption, based on what we know right now, is that this was an assassination attempt. Annie Mashin, is that going a step too far, or do you see where Bill Browder is coming from? I think we're rather jumping the gun here, I have to say, because one, we don't know uh, the name of the woman who was with him. We don't know what substances might have been involved. Um, we don't know pretty much anything around this case. And it started to unfold in the media. It was just a case of two people who appeared to take an overdose of something, it might be spice or fentanyl, which has now been discredited, or whatever, on the streets. And I think it's only really hit the headlines because it turns out this guy is indeed a Russian defector who is being protected by MI6 in the UK after the spy swap in 2010. So I think there are many uh, known unknowns in this case and I think it's slightly inflammatory uh, to start throwing around accusations, particularly in this era of Russiagate and uh, the Trump stuff and things like that. I think also um, it's also understandable that there was an immediate decontamination exercise around this case. Once this person's name had been fed into the system, once he'd been taken to hospital, once the police reported it, there would have been a red flag. And of course, in the wake of the Litvinenko case, it would have been absolutely normal mm. for the police to, to try and, and contain this issue and try and decontaminate in case there was any potential 
uh, similarity well, to the Litvinenko case, which was hideous. Annie, can I but ask you? We don't you, know that yet. It's sort of more widely, because you are from the security background, this intelligence background. Explain to us what happens in a spy swap. I mean, when these people are transferred from one country to another, what kind of protection are they given? Would he, he would have been on all the lists, presumably for MI6, for MI5, wouldn't he? Absolutely. I mean, it, from what I've seen in the reports, I don't know, you know, from the inside, obviously, from what I've seen in the reports, this guy was a high value asset for MI6 for at least 10 years. And then he was caught and he was prosecuted and he went to prison in Russia in 2006 for identifying the names of, of, of British agents in Russia, which is, you know, the crown jewels of intelligence. So it was a very serious crime. In the UK, we would also see that as very serious crime. Mm. Um, and then he was swapped in the 2010 spy ring case, which involved Anna Chapman and other Russian illegals being swapped for four, four suspects from, uh, uh, sorry, four convicts in Russia. But so, you know, you were looking at a swap of 10 Russian illegals, allegedly, for four convicted people in Russia. So he must have been pretty high value. Bill Browder, wh why would you assume uh, that the state would intervene at this point? I mean, what is it if this happened in... 2008, 2010, you know, nearly a decade ago. Why would this happen now? Well, so, so what you have to understand about Russia is you have many, many hundreds of thousands of people who work in different branches of the security services, etc. And they're, they're not motivated people, they're not loyal people, they're not necessarily honest people. And so uh, unlike here and, and other countries where people um, uh, contribute their, their service uh, out of patriotism, they, they do so for other reasons. And so they can't assume that anyone is going to be loyal. And so the only way that, 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 that Putin can assure loyalty is to absolutely viciously and completely punish disloyalty, no matter where and when and how. And so he has to create an incentive, a, a terrible incentive, so that everybody else around says, you know, if I in, in any way veer off the track, do what this guy did, then terrible things are going to befall me in the way that, that it's done to him. Does that make sense to you, Annie Mashon, that this is somehow Putin reasserting a sort of uh, a flexing of muscles? I mean, obviously, we don't know anything about foul play at this point, but as a way of operating by the Russian president. It, one, it would seem unlikely in this particular case because they would not have handed him back to the West if they'd seen him as being a threat. Um, but two, I find that slightly bizarre statement from your other guest in the sense that, uh, yes, a lot of patriots go and work for the intelligence agencies uh, in America and in the UK. I mean, I was one of them. That was my motivation. And across the rest of the West. However, a lot of patriots also do the same thing in Russia. And to, to try and make a, a distinction between the motivation, I think, is slightly disingenuous. How about it? Oh, I, 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 I don't really know, you know, what... what uh, I, I can't really say for sure who, whose motivations are, are where, but what I can say for sure is that Putin, and, and we saw this completely and, and absolutely with uh, Litvinenko, that he ha he, Putin makes, the way Putin operates is to make examples out of people. Um, and uh, he doesn't have loyalty anywhere in, in, in his own country. His country is completely full of, of uh, disloyal people who are profiting from different uh, enterprises, etc. And so the way he goes about um, creating loyalty is by by creating a, a very, very severe punishment for people who are disloyal. And he said so. We, we just listened to him on, on the television um, saying that exact thing, that, that, um, that if somebody betrays their, their brothers in arms, then terrible things will happen to them. There's no mystery about that. Thank you both very much for bringing us so much this evening. Thank you. I don't want to stand behind this podium. Is it OK? What the heck? I'm the prime minister. There are those who talk about boycotting Israel. We'll boycott them. If I have a message for you today, it's a very simple one. We must stop Iran. We will stop Iran. Raise your hands high if you agree with me that President Abbas should stop paying terrorists to murder Jews.
Oh, that's very kind of you. That's very kind of you. I love you too. Thank you. Who planted her? Lawmakers in Iceland are considering a ban on male child circumcision, sparking anger from religious communities. Circumcision performed shortly after birth is widely practiced in Judaism and Islam, and an estimated one third of men worldwide are circumcised. Iceland is home to an estimated 1,500 Muslims and 250 Jews, out of a population of 336,000. The bill going through Iceland's parliament would carry a six year jail term for anyone who, quote, removes part or all of a child's sexual organs. The bill would still allow circumcisions to be performed on someone old enough to understand what is involved, but does not state an age of consent. The member of parliament who proposed the legislation said it is meant to protect children's rights, which she says take precedence over religious freedom. However, religious groups have called the proposed ban an attack on religious freedom. For United News International, I'm Matt Paul.
Hi, this is Tim from Morial Radio and Morial TV here live via Skype with James Jacob Prash, and this is This Week in Prophecy. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Thank you so much for joining us. As we often do, we'll begin This Week in Prophecy with the news from the Middle East, specifically this time Israel. Israeli elections are looming. They may take place later this year, but there are two conflicting political scenarios coming into play. If Mr. Netanyahu was re-elected, he would be the longest standing Israeli Prime Minister, or what we call in Hebrew, Harosh Memshala ever, even surpassing Ben-Gurion, if he indeed won the election, if his coalition won the election of the Kud bloc and its coalition partners. On one hand, this looks good for him. He's made recent gains despite the efforts of his political opponents to indict him legally on fraud charges, as we've said, very similar to what's happening in the United States with Mr. Trump. His enemies are unable to beat him democratically and electorally are trying to criminally prosecute him for crimes that are at best unproven or unprovable, if they ever took place to begin with, which is quite doubtful. So, too, this is taking place in the government of Mr. Netanyahu. Even one of the judges got in trouble, much the same in Israel as one of the, as the FISA court is in trouble in the United States. There is talk in the United States, of course, of a second special prosecutor to investigate the Justice Department and FISA. That may be a very good idea, but Israel has a parallel scenario. But despite it, both Mr. Trump and America seems to have gained popularity because of the success of some of his policies, and Mr. Netanyahu gaining popularity in Israel. Although the Shas party, which is not a good party for Jewish believers in Israel, has lost two seats, other religious factions have gained. And through this, he probably has gained at least two seats in the Knesset if the election were held today guaranteeing he would be re-elected if the coalition held together. That is the positive sign. The right center government of Mr. Netanyahu would likely continue. He'd be undefeated. Problem. His coalition partners are the religious parties. As we've warned many times, proportional representation is the least democratic form of democracy if one wishes to consider it to be democracy at all. Small parties needed to form a coalition make demands out of proportion to their size and representation in the government, engaging in political blackmail. Elections are not decided by a popular mandate of the voters or on a regional or district basis, but by building coalitions, meetings between party leaders making deals it becomes horse trading in which the people have no say. This is how the religious parties, even anti-Zionist religious parties, who are small in number, are able to use their few seats or their limited representation to force the Israeli taxpayers to subsidize their yeshivas, to subsidize the Ministry of Religious Affairs, as well as two rabbinates, one Ashkenazi and one Sephardic. It is how they obtain exemption from military service. This has become an issue. Mr. Netanyahu and other of his coalition partners are opposed to religious Jews not having to serve in the military. There is a religious branch of the military for them to serve in called Hezdari Yeshiva. However, the ultra-Orthodox refuse. Every time there's a war or a crisis in the Middle East, you see them lining up at Ben Gurion Airport near Tel Aviv, at Lode near Tel Aviv, and getting on airplanes for New York. These people are seen as cowards, hypocrites, and parasites by a substantial percentage of the Israeli public. The move to end religious exemption for military service has resulted in riots, protests, opposition from right-wing coalition partners who will threaten to bring down the Israeli government, that is to say, the religious partners, the religious parties. So Mr. Netanyahu's capacity to hold a coalition together is 
being threatened by the political blackmail of the religious parties. On the other hand, if it is held together, despite the efforts of his opponents to bring him down legally, he would win an election if the coalition holds. We've asked for prayer for Mr. Trump, and we ask for prayers just as earnestly for Mr. Netanyahu, that the Lord would stay his hand. These right-wing religious parties are no friends of Jewish believers. They are no friends of Hamaminim, of Agufa Mashiach in Israel, the body of, of, of the Messiah of Christ in Israel. No friends. They are parasitic. They are hypocritical. Why should a secular Israeli have to go to the army and they're not? They will hide behind Jews, braver, with more integrity than themselves, to protect them. And they think that should be something they're entitled to. They think that while others pay for their educations, although they're subsidized, they should be completely sub sub subsidized to sit in the yeshiva all day and other Jews have to support them. This is their mentality. And a lot of secular Israelis of both main political streams, left center and right center, are fed up with it. There is too long of a history of this. We don't see it ending unless proportional representation ends. The reason being, proportional representation gives avenue, platform, mechanism, means to small parties to make extravagant demands, otherwise we'll bring the government down. We've seen this in other places that have proportional representation. We've seen it in Germany, where you had the Green Party controlling the foreign ministry in one coalition, a party at complete ideological odds with the mainstream party in power. It just doesn't work. The Liberal Democratic Party wanted to have proportional representation in Britain because the Liberal Democratic Party in Britain is neither liberal nor democratic. It is fascist and anti-democratic. It wants socialist bureaucrats to impose policy and law, preferably ones that are unelected and preferably ones that are not British doing it from Europe on back of closed doors. This was the Lib Dems in Great Britain. It is a bad system of government. It is an unworkable form of democracy. Yet Israel is unfortunately saddled with it. This week in prophecy, however, these two rival scenarios have come into play. The latest polls show, again, for some of the religious parties, decline for others, but an overall net gain of two for Mr. Netanyahu. One of his partners would be Natali Bennett, the present education minister. Again, the religious want to control education. The Ministry of the Interior, which is a comparable to the, Amer to the British Home Office or the Amer American Justice Department, almost, controlling things like citizenship and immigration and so forth. And they want to control anything to do with religion, obviously, and, 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 and even culture, if they can. And they make these demands. But the main thing they want is to extract money from the Israeli taxpayer and the Israeli workers so that yeshiva boys won't have to work and won't have to fight. They leave that to others. We have to understand that ultra-Orthodox Jews in Israel look upon secular Jews or even Jews who are moderately religious the way they looked upon Gentiles from the shtetl. Orthodox Jews are the antithesis of Zionism. Remember, the founders of Zionism, Theodore Herzl, Ben-Gurion, Nahum Goldman, all of these people, they were secular Jews. Ben-Gurion saw a cultural value and an ethical moral value in Judaism, but he was not religious. He needed the National Religious Party to form his coalition, so he began this problem with good intention, but that's how it came about. As long as the National Religious Party was in league with the Israeli Labor Party, the Marak, they always had power. That shifted under Menachem Begin when the religious parties went to the right. They'll go wherever the butter is for their bread. They have no ideological commitment to Zionism, most of them. Some, again, are even anti-Zionist. 
Now let's understand how they are the antithesis of what Israel was meant to be. When the Jews came back to Israel, they were saying, we're going to be the Am Ha'aretz, the people of the land. If we had a farm in Poland or Lithuania, our barn would have been burned and our land confiscated in a pogrom. We were forced into certain trades and businesses, but now we want to have our own land and go back to the way ancient Israel was, a nation of farmers and soldiers, as well as having the professions, industries, and so forth. The religious said, no, we want to be the people of the shtetl, the ghetto. Anywhere you go from Williamsburg in Brooklyn to Stamford Hill in London to the Borough Park in Brooklyn, Antwerp, Holland, and into Israel, B'nai Brach, Meir Sharim, wherever they are, they turn their neighborhoods into shtetls. They are similar to the Amish people in the United States going back to the 17th century. They don't look to the scriptures or to their ancient heritage for their identity in the land. They look to shtetls headed by rabbis, sometimes mystical rabbis, Kabbalists if they're Hasidic, in Lithuania, Poland, Galicia, Eastern Europe. That's their model of what Judaism should be. Fiddler on the roof. That's what they want Israel to be. You have an ideological conflict. Now, there are religious who are not like this. There are nationalist Zionists. But this, too, is peculiar. Rabbis were nearly uniform, apart from certain exceptions like Rabbi Cook. Rabbis were uniform in condemning Zionism, condemning Ben-Gurion, condemning Herzl. They were against it. Even Reformed Jews called their synagogues temples meaning our homeland, our promised land, is the United States. Temple Emmanuel on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, here's the temple. We don't worry about a temple in Jerusalem anymore. It was only the Holocaust that changed their mind, forcibly. It was only the anti-Semitism of, of Hitler and Stalin that, that changed the mind of religious Jews. If the rabbis were the spiritual shepherds of the Jewish people, why didn't they? re-establish the Jewish state? Why weren't they the Halutzim, the pioneers? Why did God have to use Jewish socialists? Many of them, even atheists or agnostics. Why didn't he use the rabbis? Then we have the Askala, the Jewish Enlightenment, which came about with a relative of the composer Felix Mendelssohn. It was an amazing breakthrough. The reason you see Jewish intellectuals and academics and scientists and a disproportionate amount of Jewish talent in so many fields and professions, that is a result of the Askelah, the Jewish Enlightenment. When Jewish learning and culture was controlled by the rabbis, the Jews were an ignorant people of the shtetl. The rabbis held the Jews back intellectually and culturally. And now in Israel, they're trying to do the same thing, control the Ministry of Religious Affairs, control the Ministry of Education. They should be the ones that determines Jewish identity based on their beliefs. Israel is the only democracy in the world that denies freedom of religion to Jews. Certainly to Jewish believers in Yeshua. They oppose them. But an anti-Zionist ultra-Orthodox rabbi can be a rabbi in Israel and be subsidized his yeshiva, his synagogue, his salary can be subsidized by the taxpayer, even though he's against the existence of the state. But a conservative or a reformed rabbi who is pro-Zionist cannot be legally licensed. They cannot perform a wedding or a burial, even a rite of passage that would be legally recognized. Israel denies freedom of religion to other Jews because of the orthodox and ultra-orthodox. Yet these are the coalition partners and the game that Mr. Netanyahu is forced to play. What becomes really sad is when you see so-called Christian Zionist organizations who don't appear to give a hoot about the salvation of Israel or evangelizing Jews, seeking to befriend these same rabbis who curse Jewish believers and who make war 
against the ideological ethos of the state denying freedom of religion to other Jews, especially, but not only, Jewish believers in Yeshua. And they pandered to them, some of them going with dual covenant theology, believing Jews could be saved without Yeshua. This presents another problem for Mr. Netanyahu. He has these people in his coalition, internally, domestically, but externally, he knows he is dependent upon the goodwill of evangelical Christians, premillennial born-again believers in the United States, and to a lesser degree in other countries, such as Britain, Canada, Australia, but certainly in the all-important USA, he knows that a beneficial American foreign policy towards Israel depends in significant part on the goodwill and political support of born-again Christians in the United States. He knows that. So on one hand, he has to befriend the believers, Gentile believers, knowing what they believe and knowing that there's Jewish believers among them. At the same time, he has to befriend the ultra-Orthodox to make his coalition. It's quite a mess, quite a tightrope to walk, yet he walks it. At the same time, his political enemies are seeking to go after him. This is an incredible situation. Again, we urge prayer for the Russian Mamshala, for Benjamin Netanyahu. But these statistics and latest polls were released this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, we see the aftermath of the Italian elections. Something remarkable has rather happened now. Italy is in significant trouble economically. Ireland has somewhat marginally recovered. They are being called the pigs by the more affluent countries in Europe. Not as in swine, but as in Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain. It's a double entendre. The center-left collapsed to the extent that ever existed in the most recent Italian elections. Italy has had an unbelievable number of governments since the end of the Second World War. An unbelievable. They just don't last. But what we saw in this election in Italy, again, where Rome is, the European Union was founded at the Treaty of Rome is a growth in Euroscepticism, concerns about Muslim immigration, and an incipient populism. Now, in the United States, this populism is on the right, what elected Mr. Trump. On the left, it's what rallied people to Bernie Sanders against the Democratic Party establishment, which even the American left, at least the honest ones, knows is corrupt. The American primary system is completely rigged. They have super candidates who the Democratic Party establishment can vote for the candidate of their choice. <coughs> so what the people actually vote for can be overrided by the powers that be. There's nothing democratic about the American Democratic Party. Bernie Sanders proves it. He was washed out by the Clinton machine due to superdelegates. So you have a deficient system in the Democratic Party in the United States. But a populism among the Democrats grew with Mr. Sanders just as people got fed up with rhinos in the United States, with Democrats in the Republican Party, people like John McCain and Senator Flake and, and uh, Susan Collins and the Bush family and uh, Senator Murkowski. These people are Republican Party establishment. They're really much the same as Democrats in many respects. John McCain, with his single vote, John McCain saved Obamacare in the United States. It could have been gotten rid of. John McCain saved it. And he's from a state, Arizona, that has had the highest increase in health premium costs monthly, 117% increase to families for medical insurance in Arizona 
and their own senator, who was defeated by Obama, then humiliated by Obama at a meeting in Blair House where Obama told him the election is over. He comes back and publicly licks Obama's boots and votes to save Obamacare. American conservatives, independents, and ideological Republicans got fed up with the Bush machine and fed up with the rhinos and went for Mr. Trump against the Republican Party establishment. That's why people like John Kasich and John McCain hate the Trump administration just as much as the Democrats hate it. He beat the establishment. Now, I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not singing his praises. But I'm saying we need to pray for him and Mr. Pence. They beat two corrupt political machines, the Democratic Party and the mainstream Republican Party. Who can forget how after September 11th, the Saudi Arabians who funded it carried the Bush administration around in their back pocket. But this is what you have. So it goes on. Italy has gone to the same kind of populism that elected Mr. Trump. Italy has gone to the same kind of populism that voted for Brexit in the UK. Now it is spreading to other countries in Europe, even to Italy. This is very significant politically. And it happened this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, more problems for Mr. Putin and the Russians with their military intervention in Syria. A Russian AN-26 transport plane crashed short of the runway in Syria, killing 39 people at the air base that Russia rents from the Assad government uh, at Kamamim, near Latakia, near Latakia. Now, this is a base he rents. It's not a operational base that is Syrian with Soviets. Oh, I'm sorry. This, stop that. This is not an operational base of the Assad Syrian regime with Russian planes operating from it in support of Syria or in tandem with Syria. This is a Russian base. The Russians can use that base for any air operations they want to. But the plane crashed, killing 39. Intelligence reports from Israel say the two pilots were likely drunk on vodka. Good luck, Mr. Putin. This comes a month after a Sukhoi 25 SU 25 fighter plane was shot down, most likely by an FN 6 Chinese Manipad mobile ground to air missile. Chinese will sell anything to anybody, and they don't care if you shoot down Russian planes. Well, the Russian plane was shot down by anti-Assad Syrian forces using a Chinese missile a month ago. The pilot managed to eject, got into a gunfight with the anti-Assad forces who shot him dead. There are some reports he may have killed himself rather than be captured. This took place over the Idlib province in Syria one month ago. Mr. Putin did not want it very popularized, but he can't keep quiet about the crash of the AN-26 this week in prophecy. Let us continue. This week in prophecy in the Republic of Ireland, Ireland state is now very precarious in the EU, because Northern Ireland is Brexit, the Republic of Ireland is solidly in the EU for the time being. The integration of the economies of Northern and Southern Ireland and the economic uh, dependence of the Republic of Ireland on Britain, where a lot of its unemployed labor force goes to to find jobs, repatriating money into the Irish economy, has become very precarious since Brexit. Will it be a soft border or a hard border between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland? Will EU tariffs come into play? They're being denied exemptions by powers in Europe. They're demanding the powers of exemption in Ireland and in Northern Ireland. Again, it's created one of the complications, Theresa May, an inept prime minister who was pro-Remain. She's not Brexit. 
is facing in her continually failed series of negotiations. Nonetheless, in Ireland, the Teshek, that is their prime minister, Leo Varadkar, ironically, he's half Indian. He's half Indian from India. He's not full-blooded Irish. Now, this is not a new phenomenon in Ireland. Ireland's first Teshek and later president, Eamon de Valera, was born in Manhattan on Lexington Avenue. Coming from New York, he lived in New York as a small boy and was taken back to Ireland. So he's an American citizen by birth, but he was only half Irish. He was half Spanish. He spoke Spanish as well as Irish and English. He spoke the Spanish language. Eamon de Valera. The Irish have a penchant for this. They like this somehow. Ireland has a stronger tie with the diasporic Irish than most other countries have with their diasporas. It's similar to Israel. They're still seen as part of that nation in some extended sense, to a degree. Not to the same degree as Israel, perhaps, but more than most other countries would be. <clears throat> Again, capital investment has a lot to do with this. Nonetheless, he wants to change the Irish Constitution, which outlaws non-therapeutic abortion. The Irish Supreme Court has issued a decision allowing for this, and the Irish Prime Minister has called for legalized abortions in Ireland this week in prophecy. This testifies to the demise of the traditional Ireland as it was established by Eamon de Valera and the growing influence of Europe and the European left in Ireland. This never would have been allowed in traditional Ireland. The Roman Catholic Church had too much power and influence. But now that the Roman Catholic Church is so discredited and, and is seen as immoral and corrupt by the young people on a wide scale because of the long history of pedophilia perpetrated against children by priests, the Irish Christian brothers and nuns that was suppressed and hidden but has now come to light and has continued, involving conspiracies of protecting them by the Irish police and prosecutors. Now it is in the public domain. The Irish Roman Catholic Church no longer has the moral influence or credibility or political influence it once had. This was brought out in the dial, the Irish Parliament, where the plain facts concerning the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church and its hierarchy, its bishops and cardinals in Ireland, was documented as a matter of public record on public television on the floor of the dial of the parliament, the national parliament. This shows that the Roman Catholic Church has lost its grip on Ireland more than anything else. Now, we do not celebrate the change of the Eighth Amendment. Non-therapeutic abortion is murder is murder. Whatever benefits that may come from the demise of Roman Catholicism, this is not a benefit. Again, we say this as a ministry that is biblically evangelical or scripturally evangelical, that's in firm disagreement with the Roman Catholic Church and its doctrines. Nonetheless, any influence it once had against abortion is gone. It is also well accepted in Ireland that the Taoiseach, the Prime Minister, half Indian, half Irish, Leo Varadkar, is a practicing homosexual. Again, traditionally in Ireland, it was a public disgrace to be a homosexual. That is one of the reasons for the decline of religious vocations, where there's fewer people going into the Catholic seminary in Maynooth in Ireland and into the clergy. Traditionally, Irish homosexuals, to find expression for their homosexuality, had to go into the Catholic Church in an all-male environment, where they put on vestments, they would dress like women, they, some of them would have access to children if they were pedophile or inclined towards pedophilia. It was the church that gave expression to their homosexuality, and it was all secret, and they could cover it up with a cassock. Nuns the same. 
It was called special friendships for lesbians. They'd get their heads shaved to look like men in tonsorial rites that are of pagan origin, but they'd shave their heads. They'd be in an all-female environment. And the feminine lesbians would take names like Sister Mary Elizabeth, while the, as we would call them in New York, butch, the masculinized lesbians would take names like Sister Michael Patrick. So you had this lesbian environment in convents. Now that homosexuality is out of the closet and publicly prolific, even the Teshek, the prime minister, being uh, a homosexual, the prohibitions are gone. Thus, the Roman Catholic Church declines further because homosexuals and lesbians don't have to go into the Roman Catholic clergy the way they once did to find expression and acceptance for their for their orientation that traditionally would have been considered a perversion. It is the main factor in the decline of religious vocations in Ireland and in other Catholic countries. Nonetheless, that's what's happening in Ireland this week in prophecy is an EU country. Please watch it. Please pray that the Eighth Amendment is not altered or repealed, that non-therapeutic abortion remains outlawed in Ireland. I can care less about the Catholic Church and its clergy. It's wicked. It's corrupt. But I do care about the unborn. And so should you. Let's move on. Once again, for the first time in the history of the State of Israel, Prince William will be the first royal to visit Israel. Remember, without the British, there wouldn't be an Israel. We know the downside of what the British did after the Second World War. Jews who came from concentration camps, the Jews would re-inter in detention camps in Cyprus to stop them from coming to the land that they were promised by the British government under the Belfarro Declaration, which was revoked by the White Paper. The Zionists did not want to fight the British. There were 30,000 Jews who fought in the Palestine Legion, under the Marib, under General Montgomery and under the British against the Germans. They fought and against the Vichy French. They fought for the British and the British Army. Former President Heim Herzog was a colonel in the British Army, the founder of the Israeli Air Force. Ezra Weizmann was a pilot in the Royal Air Force. The Zionists, soon to be Israelis, did not want conflict with the British. The British did tremendous harm to the cause of Zionism. They did not vote for the partition in the UN. And I believe that is one of the reasons we see the decline, and I've seen the decline, of the British Empire. How blessed and the blessed, the incursed and the cursed, the it's most unfortunate. Nonetheless, we have to look at the good side, the positive side that preceded it. It was General Allenby that liberated Jerusalem. It was Australian and New Zealand military forces at Beersheba that defeated the Ottoman armies aligned with the Kaiser. It was under the British that the railroads were built, that the port of Haifa was built, that other infrastructure was built before the white paper was issued. Britain did much good for Israel and the Jews, and God bless them. They had a heritage influenced by believers such as the Earl of Shaftesbury, going back to Benjamin Disraeli, who was a Jewish Christian. They did much good for the Jews, and God blessed them. When they turned against Israel, they brought the curse of God against themselves. This is unfortunate. But why is Prince William to be the first royal coming, as was announced formally this week in prophecy? Again, the royals make these royal visits at the behest of the British Foreign Office. Why is he coming? Because there has been a forced rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and some of the Gulf states and Israel in fear of Iran and what Iran is and the threat Iran poses to Sunni Islam. Hence, to cement a cooperation between Israel and the more fundamentalist Muslim states of the Arabian Peninsula. The British and Americans have a vested interest in doing all they can to encourage this. The United States, in league with the UK, 
want this strategic cooperation between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Saudi Arabia is fighting in Yemen with Iranian-backed forces. Saudi Arabia is threatened. Its new crown prince, Prince Mohammed bin Salman, is bringing about reforms, even curtailing the powers of the Mutawa and the Imams. This is a good thing. Salafist Islam needs to be destroyed. Now, he cannot destroy it. Wahhabism needs to be destroyed. He cannot destroy it, but he can definitely de-intensify it and curtail the powers and influence it has had. As he does this in Saudi Arabia and makes a rapprochement towards Israel, even becoming non-supportive of Hamas, which Saudi Arabia had been in Gaza, and non-supportive of Syrian and Iranian ambitions in Lebanon. He draws closer to Israel out of a forced necessity because of Iran. Could this be a factor in why, with the possible exception of Libya, put, there are no Arab countries in the coalition in the Gog and Magog constellation of invaders who will come to Israel? There are no Arab nations there. Jordan, Sudan, which would be Arabia, they're not there. Could it be? It certainly relates to the Prince of Persia, the demonic power over Iran that we see in Daniel chapter 10. But now Prince William will make the first royal visit, as was formally and officially announced, to Israel this week in prophecy. Let us continue. Iceland. Iceland is a very secular state. New proposed legislation in Iceland would effectively, effectively ban Judaism as a religion by outlawing circumcision. It does it on humanitarian grounds, claiming it is child abuse, without reference to the scientific realities. The United Nations, I'm sorry, <coughs> among others, the United States Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, and multiple studies have shown that the benefits of male circumcision greatly outweigh any risks. It's been known since the 1930s that smegma bacillus was less present in Jewish males, and this was directly attributed to the lower levels of vaginal cancer in Jewish women. This goes back to the 1930s. It's been known. It's beneficial to women. HIV contraction, general HIV contraction, urinary tract infection, and serious urinary disease involving the urethra. And also, cancer of the male appendage are much lower in circumcised males. Where the medical risk takes place is doing it later in life. An infant baby is hyperprothrombic. It has... The higher levels of prothrombin and the enzyme that manufactures it, prothrombinase, that causes blood to clot on eight days. Then it recedes. The Taurus has circumcised the baby on the eighth day. Well, the baby is hyperprothrombic. Medical science did not know that then, but God did. After that, prothrombin goes down to normal levels. Okay, to normal levels. Adult male circumcision is a much more complicated and risky procedure. But the proposed legislation in Iceland says you cannot do it until you're 18 years of age when it's a higher risk. It makes no sense. These people do not care anything about what the scriptures say or about religion, but they don't even care about scientific reality or medical reality. They care about their own secularist agenda. This is Iceland. Other countries including New Zealand, have enforced legislation against the ritual slaughter of certain animals for meat products. Halal, Islam, is allowed to get around it because it allows for electroshock and stunning of these animals 
before the ritual slaughter. This is not allowed in Judaism. The Shechter is not allowed to electrocute the animal. It's seen as unnecessary cruelty to the animal in Judaism. Therefore, these countries can allow, in some way, halal meat for Muslims, but not kosher meat for Jews. These laws are becoming more prevalent in Europe. There have been appeals for legislation outlawing circumcision of males in Germany, and also 67% of the British population believes it should be outlawed. Again, with no reference to the medical benefits. It is simply trying to legally outlaw Judaism as a religion. It's directed against the Jews. Muslims will always have a way around it. They will not enforce anything, even though they will claim it's a blanket enforcement. They will pander to Islam and discriminate against the Jews. I pray that this legislation does not go through in Iceland this week in prophecy. Let us continue. This week in prophecy, the Iranian Brigadier General Amir Ali Hajizeda said that Iran, this is exact words, Iran has tripled its production of military missiles. His exact words, in the past, this was a problem because of monitoring. There was too much to explain, but that's no longer a problem. In other words, thank you, Barack Obama, for giving a terrorist nation a license to manufacture missiles and curtailing monitoring. Thank you, John Kerry. Again, many people would look upon this as treason. I would personally like to see John Kerry and Barack Obama both have been tried for treason, not just impeached. That would not be legally possible or politically possible. But that's what should have happened. Now, again, this is not partisan. When George Bush continued the express visa programs for Saudi Arabians after September 11th for a full year, despite the fact that most of the hijackers on September 11th were Saudi Arabian, I would have put him on trial the same if I could have done it. I certainly would have impeached him. This pandering to Iran has a long history. Let us remember that the Reagan administration, Ronald Reagan, sold weapons to this terrorist regime that had held American hostages, grabbed from an American embassy, and Reagan sold them weapons. Then he and his administration lied and said it didn't happen, and when he was caught and found out it did happen, he pled senility virtually. This was Ronald Reagan. I'm not speaking about Democrat or Republican. I'm speaking about the actions of individuals. What Reagan did with Iran was horrific. What Obama did with John Kerry is even worse. They're now bragging about it. We can do something we couldn't have done without this agreement, thanks to Barack Obama. And they're bragging about it this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, Rabbi, Chief Rabbi of the city of Ramakan near Tel Aviv, the Diamond Exchange, the Borsa is, Rabbi Yehoshua Shapira has spoken out against homosexuality once again as being a non Jewish practice forbidden by Torah. He said, We're not homophobic, we're not afraid of these people nor are we afraid of their agenda. We're not homophobic, but we're not insane. This is not natural, not normal, and it's destructive. And he said that these people have a disease and they need to be cured. And he says he knows some Jewish homosexuals who have been. He decried the way the left-wing media in Israel and internationally speaks about people who simply don't agree with homosexuality accusing them of having a phobia. Again, I don't hold with Talmudic Judaism. But in this case, this rabbi has told the truth this week in prophecy. 
let's understand what else is happening. President Macron of France has again forcefully denounced President Trump's decision to move the American embassy to Jerusalem. France, the country where you had three weeks of riots in the banlieue around Paris set alight by Muslim gangs. France, where you had the terrorist attacks and bombings in theaters, restaurants. France, where you had the Charlie Hebo murders. Where radical Islam is going out of control. And the response of Mr. Macron is the usual. Face Mecca and genuflect. Pander to radical Islam in your own country. Side with Islam against nations braver than your own, with more sense than your own, who will stand up to radical Islam, such as Israel and the United States. This is what Macron essentially represents. Of course, he doesn't care what the scriptures say. But again, we would point people to the book of Obadiah, verse 15. They side with the enemies of Israel against Israel. The same things that happened to Israel will happen to them. There will be more French victims of Islamic terror. You just think at a resort in the south of France, grabbing a truck and running people over. And he kisses their feet and panders to them. This is the government of France. Weak and cowardly. This is why people in Britain and America and Canada think about France in historical terms. Not since Verdun, some would say not since Napoleon, have they had any courage. At Dunkirk, the French had 66 divisions and refused to fight. They let the British and Americans win the war and then resented them for doing it. 66 divisions. When Hitler came to power, France still had the biggest armed forces in continental Europe. And they just caved, bowed the knee to Hitler, and the government became Vichy. This is the French history. Where is the courage and integrity that the French have had in times past? It is gone. As the Vichy bowed to Hitler, Macron now bows to radical Islam. This week in prophecy. Let us continue. This week in prophecy, four Israeli Jewish teenagers were arrested for praying on the Temple Mount. Their claim is they were not praying. They were simply up there. But even if they were, praying would not be illegal. They were seen bowing their heads by some reports. They denied this, as did a rabbi who witnessed their arrest. They were surrounded by radical Muslims yelling, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. The police arrested them to prevent the Arabs from going on a rampage. But they committed no crime. The Temple Mount will continue to be the most disputed piece of real estate on the face of the earth. One square mile, the biggest man-made plateau in the world, going back to Herod the Great. One square mile. Jerusalem will be trampled down by the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is completed. That's what the scriptures say. And that's going to be the focus. Keep watching the Temple Mount. As I've always said, there are two temples we need to watch. One is the temple in Jerusalem, the heart of Ayat, to be rebuilt as the Millennial Temple. I'm sorry, to be rebuilt as the Tribulational Temple. The other temple is the Body of Christ. We are the temple. The New Testament tells us seven times with abomination flooding into the church. This week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, the Rasmussen polls released some rather remarkable statistics from their questionnaires and surveys. 
of independents in the United States and 22% of Republicans in the United States believed that Muslims were discriminated against in the United States. Only 22% of Republicans and only 39% of independents. 56% of Democrats, however, believe Muslims are discriminated against in the United States. This is after September 11th. How are they discriminated against? What Muslim country would give Christians and Jews the rights they get in America? They won't answer this. However, more Christians have been persecuted, even killed, for their faith in the last 50 years than in all of Christian history. Forty-seven percent of Democrats did not believe the persecution of Christians was a major issue. Seventy-six percent of Republicans did, and sixty-four percent of Independents did, but forty-seven percent of Democrats did not. In other words, more Democrats are concerned about discrimination against Muslims in the United States than they are the slaughter, slaughter of Christians in northern Nigeria, in the Sahel in Africa, and in the Middle East, and in Pakistan, and increasingly in Indonesia. They're more concerned about discriminating against Muslims in the United States than they are the slaughter often reaching genocidal proportions of Christians. That was released by Rasmussen this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, the Turkish government of Mr. Erdogan closed in on the Alvin region where there are a million Kurds, a number of them refugees from northern Alvin. Turkey is asking, in fact, demanding the United States not allow Turkish forces in Iraq and in Syria to counterattack the Turks, claiming that they are all terrorists, that they're part of the YPK. The rights of Kurds are non-existent on the Turkish domain. Not only are the Kurds kept the second class citizens and discriminated against in their own homelands inside of Turkey, but now Turkey is exporting its oppression of Kurds into Iraq and Syria. We are left with the fact that something has happened in Turkey. Finally, the American government and the Trump administration has spoken out against it. Mr. H. R. McMasters addressed this, saying that Turkey is one of the two nations in the world most responsible for the propagation of state-sponsored radical Islam, Iran, of course, being the other. Turkey is funding the most radicalism. Turkey has purchased, in violation of boycotts, the Russian S-400 rockets, missiles, I'm sorry, the Russian S-400 missiles, much to the annoyance of the United States. Turkey has also violated American sanctions on Iran through, through Turkish business fronts, laundering money in the United States on behalf of the Iranian regime. There has been an arrest and an indictment is pending. But this was done with the approval of Mr. Erdogan and his regime, violating American sanctions. He's also suppressing the human rights and religious freedom of Christians in Turkey, as we have reported multiple times. At last, Mr. McMasters, the National Security Advisor to President Trump, has told the truth. They are getting closer to Russia in many respects, despite Turkey having shot down a Russian aircraft. It's about business. 
This could present problems because Turkey controls the Bosporus and the Dardanelles necessary for trade and for defense of NATO's southern perimeter to get American and other NATO warships into the Black Sea. Former countries of the Soviet bloc, now in the Western sphere like Romania and Bulgaria, are dependent on Black Sea ports and free access through the Dardanelles and the Bosporus. The American Navy and NATO is dependent on the Bosporus and the Dardanelles for access to the North Sea. Turkey knows this, and Turkey will use this. Do not be surprised if Turkey just comes in to the Soviet access, as long as it can promote its Islamic agenda. The stupidity of Putin, who has pandered to Islam externally in Iran, and now with Turkey, is stupid because it ignores the Islamic threat in his own country, particularly what happened in Chechnya and to the accessions. It will catch up with him. With a declining ethnic Russian population and a growing Islamic population inside Russia, the things he is supporting externally are going to backfire and turn on him internally. But he doesn't think in those terms. He's not a strategic thinker. He thinks short term. Everything Mr. Putin does doesn't work or it backfires. He's hurt his economy by grabbing Crimea. Instead of letting the people of Crimea decide by free elections that they want to be part of Russia or the Ukraine, he grabbed it, resulting in sanctions. These have hurt Russia, similar with his attempted bullying of the Ukraine. It has forced the Baltic states, countries like Poland and the Ukraine, to become increasingly hardened against Russia. But not only that, neutral Finland has very conspicuously boosted its defense spending. And this week in Prophecy announced it has a new kind of landmine that is not subterranean, but it is launched from a subterranean platform into the air and sprays bullets and shrapnel. Be deployed along the Russian border. Remember, Russia grabbed Finnish territory and still occupies it. That is one of the reasons, or that is the reason, Turkey, I'm sorry, that is the reason why Finland sided with Hitler against Russia. They were not opposed to Britain or America, but they were opposed to Russia. They wanted their land back. These sentiments run long. Even Finland is responding to Putin's remilitarization. Mr. Putin thought that by helping to engineer crisis in the Middle East, it would drive the price of oil up. That doesn't work anymore. It did not benefit his oil and natural gas-based economy. Because of fracking in the United States and increased drilling, this year the United States, already having surpassed Saudi Arabia in daily output, over 10 billion barrels per day, will surpass Russia, going to 11 billion nearly, by the end of the present year. Those days of astronomical prices are over. Mr. Putin has an oil and gas-based economy. At the same time, whatever the success of fracking for oil has been nothing compared to the American success of natural gas. Now liquid gas containers and tankers are selling American natural gas to Eastern Europe, taking away Russia's markets, at least cutting into them. And this will increase. These countries don't like Russia and would much rather do business with the United States. Mr. Putin has only hurt his own economy. At one point, oil went so low when OPEC tried to make fracking unprofitable by oversupplying over, over the world with oil and reserves that Mr. Putin reached a point where some of his oil fields could not operate because the oil was worth less than the cost of pumping it. 
He's in a vulnerable position. He completely miscalculated with oil when he tried to stir up the Middle East. Instead of using the high proceeds from oil when the prices were over $100 a barrel to diversify his economy, he instead made it his priority to rebuild the old Soviet war machine, which he can't do anyway, economically or realistically. He doesn't think long term. Everything that man tries fails. Now, with more Russians being killed in the Middle East, the Russians are being reminded of the disaster they had in Afghanistan. A imbroglio, as the Americans had in Vietnam, that they cannot get themselves out of easily, that is too costly. It's beginning to harken back in the minds of the Russian people to Afghanistan. They're afraid of getting into it and there's a high economic cost to what's happening in Syria. He's so desperate to avenge the collapse of the Soviet Union. He doesn't think long term. He doesn't see the Islamic threat to his own country or the benefits he would have had from strategic cooperation with the West, with America, with Europe, with Israel. He digs his own grave. He can't help it. He's a grave digger. He digs his own grave and he thinks he's reviving Russia. Well, he's only digging the grave economically. The very policies that caused Russia to lose the Cold War a failed economic policy, investing everything in military and defense production, is what brought down the Soviet Union. Now the West is reacting. Now countries in Eastern Europe, even Finland, are reacting to what Putin is doing. This will drive up his defense costs even further. At the same time, oil prices remain relatively low compared to what they were and America about to overtake him as the world's biggest producer and cutting further into his export markets with natural gas. The man just does not think. He doesn't realize that what he's doing is exactly what Chavez and Maduro did in Venezuela. He's pushing Russia in the direction of Venezuela, but he's not intelligent enough, foresightful enough to see it. He's too obsessed in his short-term thinking with holding political power and with his anger at the West for his having lost the Cold War. Not thinking of the fact that it's the very same policies as he's pursuing that made it possible for the West to win the Cold War without firing a shot to see the collapse of the Soviet Union. The man, he's either a man of low intelligence or he's crazy. He's, he's so nearsighted, he may as well be blind to reality. But this is what Ezekiel describes. I will put hooks in your jaws and pull you in. It indeed makes us wonder, in light of Ezekiel 37, if we are coming to a Gog and Magog style scenario in fulfillment or partial fulfillment of that prophecy, even though we know the ultimate Gog and Magog is at the end of the millennial reign of Christ in the book of Revelation, there's so much evidence that there can be two, one prefiguring the other. But that's what's taking place this week in prophecy. It's happening in Russia, it's happening in Turkey, and it will continue to happen in all probability. Let's continue looking at this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, Benjamin Netanyahu publicly warned the Palestinian Authority that Israel is not much longer going to tolerate the Palestinian Authority taking international aid and using it to fund terrorists. He pointed out specifically to Hakim Awad, who murdered a Jewish husband and wife and three of their six children, holding the children down as they were murdered. He received $2 million in pay and benefits from the Palestinian Authority. 
Why should the United States government subsidize the Palestinian Authority to do this? Yet the UN is complaining about the budget deficit for the UN fund to help Palestinians, supposedly. The Palestinian Arabs hosted demonstrations using children holding signs and placards demanding the money. Now you have to understand, to them, that's demitude. They expect the infidel to pay them for not being Muslim. They're entitled to it. They're not asking the oil-rich Arab states, their fellow Muslims, for the money. They're demanding that the UN get it from the United States, protesting the fact that Mr. Trump has cut the budget. The budget needs to be abolished completely. No American money should go to the Palestinian Authority. Mr. Netanyahu was completely correct in his delivery. This week in prophecy. Undercover units of the Israeli military, probably also Shabak, former Shin Bet, the Internal Security Agency of Israel, working with military intelligence, in plain clothes, infiltrated Palestine University. They arrested Omar Kwasani, president of the Student Union, for engaging in pro-terrorist activities on behalf of Hamas. Now, ostensibly, the Palestinian Authority is the opponent of Hamas. Hamas controlling Gaza, the Palestinian Authority controlling the West Bank. Why did the Palestinian Authority not first arrest him? Had the Palestinian Authority arrested this agent of Hamas, the terrorist, it wouldn't have happened. But it proves that their rivalry with Hamas is only about political power. They have no problem with Hamas killing Jews. This week in prophecy. This week in prophecy. North Korea has announced its willingness to engage in discussions of nuclear disarmament with South Korea and even the United States. Most informed parties attribute this to the harder line taken by the Trump administration, bringing economic threats against China if they do not curtail trade with North Korea involving coal industry upon which North Korea heavily relies for foreign exchange. The economic pressure brought against China and the threat of further pressure and sanctions against Chinese companies has caused China, basically compelled China, to begin to curtail trade with North Korea. North Korea is feeling it economically. As a result, after the Olympics, they're agreeing to talks. Now, any time the United States, going back to Jimmy Carter, has negotiated anything with North Korea, they broke it. They just used it to get money in concessions and then continue seeing it as a way to get more money in concessions. It's foolish to trust them or believe them. No sanctions should be lifted. No threat should be lifted. Nothing should be lifted. Everything should be left in place until they disarm of their nuclear capability. Economic pressure should continue. It should not even be on a negotiating table. Will you lift this? No, we won't until you disarm and then we'll lift it. You can't trust what they say. But they made the gesture, forced to do it as a result, almost certainly, of the policies of the Trump administration. This week in prophecy. It was interesting this week in prophecy that Sergei Skripal and his daughter, a former Soviet agent who was a double agent for the West, was murdered all places in Salisbury, England. He was chemically poisoned. There is a long history of the Soviets murdering and the Russians continuing that policy externally outside of their country. The most famous case was, of course, the assassination by the agents of Joseph Stalin when the KGB killed Leon Trotsky in Mexico. But it continued. 
there was a Turkish human rights activist murdered in London. He was poked with a poison dart on the tip of an umbrella on the streets of London during the Cold War. Then we had the Litvenko murders using polonium put into green tea that killed him in a restaurant in London. He had to be buried in a lead coffin, lead-lined coffin, because his corpse was so radioactive. Again, this was Putin. Putin attempted to poison and did poison, but failed to kill president of Ukraine. Turned his skin blue. You have to understand what Putin is. He's a little stolen. That's what he is. That's all he is. He needs to be recognized as that and dealt with as that. There is no serious question in the minds of MI5 or British counterintelligence or the CIA, I am sure, other than this was the work of the Putin regime. It shows the growing desperation and militancy of Mr. Putin. Remember, desperate people do de desperate things. The Soviet, I'm sorry, the Russian economy is suspended in a self-inflicted stagnation that is not going to get better long term. May get worse. This week in prophecy, the USS Iwo Jima, an amphibious assault ship capable of carrying hovercraft, fighters, helicopters, and 1,400 Marines for amphibious assault docked in the port of Haifa in preparation for joint exercises with the Israeli military. It's expected to focus on the Juniper Cobra annual exercises that will coordinate military operations with enemy missile activity. Now, obviously, this is in direct response to the deployment of Iranian missiles in Syria with American involvement with Israel it sends a signal, a very real signal, to the Iranians, to the Russians, and to the Syrians. This took place almost concurrently with the arrival of an American aircraft carrier in Vietnam, with increased military cooperation between Vietnam and the United States on the southern flank of China over China's seizure of islands in the South China Sea and China's militarization of them. This is known as gunboat diplomacy. It is not new, but it seems to be a game, not of brinkmanship, but of calculation that the Trump administration is playing effectively as compared to the weakness of previous administrations. Ever since MacArthur was fired by Harry Truman, Harry Truman, who gave China to Mao, who gave Eastern Europe to Stalin, who fired MacArthur, and has bequeathed us the mess we see with North Korea to this day. One American regime after another has pandered to North Korea. The Nixons did it over the Pueblo affair. The Carter administration certainly did it. Barack Obama, perhaps more than any other since Truman, did it. Mr. Trump has at least begun to take a stand. We see this kind of policy coming into play with China now in Vietnam, but we certainly see it coming into play with Iran, Syria, and Russia this week in prophecy. Please again pray for the Trump administration and for Mr. Trump. The aftermath of the much publicized meetings that Benjamin Netanyahu had with President Trump. It had been expected by much of the press that President Trump would propose a new peace plan with the Palestinian Arabs. That did not happen, although Mr. Trump said the United States remains committed to a peace. Instead, the meetings were dominated by strategic discussions concerning Iran and Iranian activity in Syria and Iranian surrogate activity in both Syria, Iraq, as well as in Lebanon. 
Mr. Netanyahu reportedly wanted Mr. Trump to assure it keeps American advisory and commando forces on the east bank of the Euphrates River. Mr. Trump went further. He said he wants to do that, but he wants to add to that participation from Jordan and Saudi Arabia. That would be fair that Saudi Arabia pays part of the cost and makes a significant contribution. It is also in the strategic interests of King Abdullah and Jordan to do so. If you have this cooperation with the United States orchestrating it with Saudi Arabia and Jordan, in league, in concert with Israel, against what's happening with Russia, Iran, and Turkey, you have quite a situation. Quite a situation indeed, taking aim and taking place. That is what dominated the conversation. Undoubtedly, there was some discussion of the corruption charges facing Mr. Netanyahu in Israel and the prospects of his re-election, as well as the upcoming congressional elections in the United States. And <clears throat> the FISA court scandals and the politically motivated witch hunt against President Trump that has to date found nothing that would implicate him with any kind of collusion or criminal activity with Russia. Nonetheless, Mr. Mueller has still not wrapped up his escapades and found an honest job. That's how I would personally see it. You may differ. Remember, it was Mr. Mueller, an FBI director. He removed from the FBI training manuals references to radical Islam. He's an establishment Republican. His staff is all Clinton and Obama Democrats. This is a political charade. This is a political charade. That's what it is, and that's all it is. They have found nothing so far after wasting millions of dollars of the American taxpayers' money in order to placate the Democratic Party and the left. Even the Democrats themselves are no longer talking about Russia. They're looking for other things. They were wrong and proven wrong, but won't admit it. Nothing has come to light, nor likely will it, at least nothing of any legal substance. At the same time, many things of legal and factual substance have come into play concerning FISA, concerning the actions of the Democratic Party and the Clinton campaign, with the bought and paid for dossier that was submitted as evidence to the FISA court. Yet there's no criminal prosecution. There's been no criminal prosecution of Eric Holder for contempt of Congress or of former Attorney General Lynch, who met with Bill Clinton while the investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails were happening. An American serviceman was sent to prison for a year for doing the same thing Hillary Clinton did with impunity. But that's not the concern of any special prosecutors or of the Democratic Party. It is all a political hoax. That's what it is, that's all it is. Attempting to distract the president from the pursuit of his duties. Keep him in prayer and it will not work. This week in prophecy, the Qasim Soleimani commander of Iranian forces in Iraq and Syria, who is from the Revolutionary Guard, has established an agenda strategically in Syria. Mr. Trump has a plan to counter it. That was what the meeting was about. It is also rumored, we cannot verify if it is for sure, that Mr. Netanyahu and Mr. Trump discussed the plans on how to scrap, junk, the Obama 2015 sellout to Iran, allowing Iran to become more of a strategic threat to its neighbors and to the United States. Again, an act that it's difficult to define other than treasonous in the thinking of many reasonable people. Mr. Netanyahu also addressed IPAC, the American-Israel Politi uh, Political Action Committee. <clears throat> there is a split within IPAC because its primary leader has called for a Palestinian state. It is not a united force, 
and it underscores the increasing schism between liberal American Jews particularly and the interests of Israel and the Israelis. This was also seen when female reformed rabbis would not speak out against Linda Sarsen, the anti-Semite proponent of destroying Israel, a friend of everything that is anti-Jewish, anti-democratic and anti-American, and who has opposed Muslim women activists in the area of human rights for their opposition to female genital mutilation. Yet we had female Jewish rabbis from Reformed temples defending Sasser although disagreeing with their policies concerning Israel and human rights, they look for the virtue and the positive aspects of what she's saying. This is utterly ridiculous. Can you imagine Jews in the Holocaust speaking well of Goebbels, saying it's not all bad. What he's doing to us is bad, but he says good things. This kind of stupidity is unbelievable. It must be a spiritual blindness. It must be a spiritual blindness. And of course, that blindness is not only on the Jews. The stupidity of so many of the American people supporting Barack Obama after his betrayal of America's security to the Iranians while they are funding terror and killing Americans, releasing $150 billion into their coffers making it not possible to have any kind of mandatory in inspections, letting them continue their missile program, removing any verification of the nuclear development agreement to slow it by 10 years. How can people be so stupid as to support such a thing? Yet a liberal American Jew like Chuck Schumer did. Please pray for Mr. Netanyahu and for President Trump. I personally believe it is of desperate importance that this agreement that Obama made with Iran, with John Kerry and Hillary Clinton be scrapped. Thank you so much for listening. That has been This Week in Prophecy. My name is James Jacob Prash. God bless America. God bless Israel and the Jewish people. God bless the Arab believers, especially those who are persecuted for their faith. And God bless you. Mm -hmm.